My coat got trapped in the automatic closing doors and I couldn't pull it free. I got dragged along the platform and the, the, the train pulled out at great speed. I lost my footing and then I got pulled eventually um, underneath the wheels of the train and the train sped on. I was thrown around relentlessly underneath this train as it was continuing on and then I was eventually thrown down in between the tracks and then the train kind of dis disappeared off down the horizon as I lay there she was like shaking her head from side to side saying I thought you were dead they announced that you were dead and, and I saw you go under and I knew that you wouldn't survive it It was at that point that I left my body. Welcome everyone. I'm joined today by David Ditchfield. David is a very talented painter, classical music composer, and author of the book Shine On. He's gone through a transformative NDE, which we'll be discussing today. But David, what I want to start off with is tell me a bit about yourself before that experience, before that moment in time. What was your life like? What were you thinking? What were you struggling with at the time? Mm. Okay, yeah, well, my life leading right up until the accident that I had that led onto my near-death experience, uh, I was in a pretty bad way. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd hit rock bottom in my life, basically. You know, I felt like like um, I'd run, I was running out of all options. I was running out of money. I was running out of work and I was about to lose my apartment and um you know so so yeah so life was pretty tough I basically I, I was living in in London uh, and like all capital cities it's very hard to to get by um unless you're successful um and at that point the only kind of work that I was actually picking up was uh was manual laboring work uh whatever i could find whether it was working on construction sites washing up um you know the pots and dishes in 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 a kitchen in a restaurant whatever and and all that stuff i was starting to run out of that kind of work because i was not very good at manual laboring and and it's a very skilled work especially in in the well in the field of uh construction sites so yeah so life was pretty was pretty uh, uh dire for me at that point yeah. And what did you think of the future at that point? What were you expecting? Well, I'd, I'd moved to London because I, I hoped, you know, that like that I would find all or some uh, options, some you know, I thought I'd find some opportunities because I, I always figured that like all capital cities of the world, they're the places where people make something of themselves. And I'd left school with very little qualifications. And I, where I'd grown up, there were only two options, basically, and that was to either work in a factory, uh, which I didn't particularly want to do because, again, I wasn't any good at that kind of thing, or, um, or, or, or have no work at all. So, yeah, so I'd moved to London. And um, when I moved there, a lot of the people that became my friends were working in the entertainment industry, music or arts, and they were all successful. So I was hoping that I would be part of that world, and I really wanted to be because I could see that they would, you know, they'd made a success of themselves without really having any past qualifications. You know, they hadn't been to university or anything like that. So I thought, why not me? So yeah, so those were my dreams: were to be part of that entertainment industry yeah right and then all of a sudden something happens and your life completely changes that's right um, yeah yeah what happened well as i say i was about to lose my 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 apartment and uh i um my sister was living out in in the countryside with her family and she said why don't you come stay with us for a few weeks so i did do so i went and stayed there and uh um uh a friend had come to visit me from London and she'd got to get, get back to London. So I took her to the rail station to see her off. And um, I helped her onto the car, onto the carriage of the train with her bags. And when I gave her a hug and stepped back to get off, my coat got trapped in the automatic closing doors and I couldn't pull it free. Um, it was a very thick quality sheepskin coat and it was like three quarter length. So 
it wasn't going to come out. So yeah, so I got dragged along the platform and the, the, the train pulled out at great speed. I lost my footing and then I got pulled eventually um, underneath the wheels of the train and the train sped on and um, by a miracle, I survived. So, uh, so yeah, so that was very horrific. That was very terrifying. Can imagine. And how long did, did this whole bit take uh, until they stopped the train and somebody came to save you? Well, um, the, the the UK Rail Police did a massive inquiry on it, so they told me that it took from the moment of the, the train pulling out to me going under was 13 and a half seconds. It felt it felt like a lot longer. It felt like time had stretched, you know, and, and, and it, I thought it took minutes, but no, it was seconds. Um, but basically what happened was I, I was I was thrown around relentlessly underneath this train as it was continuing on, and then I was eventually thrown down in between the tracks, and then the train kind of dis disappeared off down the horizon as I lay there. So, um, uh, but it wasn't... Um, for a, a several minutes until the train actually stopped right out in the middle of the countryside. So, so my friend told me anyhow, because she wasn't able to alert anybody because there was no guard around. She was running through the train trying to find somebody to stop the train, you know. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, so it was quite some time on until it actually stopped. But thankfully, I wasn't still attached at that point. And by a miracle, you survived. Exactly, Do you yeah. know what the odds are of surviving such an accident? Well, according to the rail police, I should not have survived it. You know, they said they'd done all their all their figures, and they said that they still don't know why and how I survived that. Um, so, really, uh, I'm sure we all know that the odds are pretty low uh, in surviving that. But I realise now that, that there was something bigger at play uh, that was. That, that 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 saved me that day. Something of far more powerful, and uh, and though we, we don't have a scientific explanation for that, it, there's lots of things in science that we don't have answers to. So it it's you know, it's it's something that I've never really doubted, um, because obviously I'm here, and um, yeah, something far greater saved me. Absolutely, and well, that's just. Um... I think I've, I've heard that before and I've heard your story before, but I think every time it's just, um, yeah, chill. Yeah. So then somebody saves you and takes you to the hospital. What happens there? Right. Well, I got to the hospital and um, it was it was it was a good sort of um, 30 minute drive to the hospital itself. And um, but by the time I got into the hospital, I was losing copious amounts of blood. Um, there was a whole team of medics waiting there for me when I arrived into the emergency department. And they started working on me, and I could hear fear in their voices. You know, I could detect it. And I knew that it wasn't all over yet, so I was still pretty scared myself that I was going to make it. And... Um, I remember my family arrived at the hospital, which again seemed pretty bizarre because I, I thought, wow, how did that all that happen? And how did they manage to suddenly arrive? You know, they come of a, a 30 minute drive themselves. But there they were. And uh, I, I spoke with them. You know, my mother was in tears. You know, she was just completely distraught. The whole family were in shock, obviously. And all I wanted to do was talk to. Um, my friend Anna who I'd been seeing off because I, I knew that she'd been through hell herself watching this all unfold because she was looking through the window of the train carriage and I thought she's going to be pretty shook up and I just wanted to connect with her and talk with her you know and she was she was like completely her face was white with with shock and she was like shaking her head from side to side saying I thought you were dead. They announced that you were dead, and and I saw you go under, and I knew that you wouldn't survive it. So um, she was amazed that I was alive. It was at that point that I left my body. I left all all the drama of the hospital. You know, I left all the severe pain that that was rushing through my body, and I went into um, into another realm, um, and. Uh, 
I I entered what felt like I thought was a small darkened space. It wasn't a foreboding darkness. It was very calm and welcoming. And um, mm -hmm. and I figured at this stage that I hadn't made it. I thought, okay, I must be dead now, <laughs> you know, because I, the odds were stacked up against me surviving at that point. And um, anyhow. I didn't panic. I didn't fear it. I didn't try and resist it. I looked around to try and get my bearings. And I remember seeing these beautiful pulsating colors of light that were just slowly pulsating all around me. And the lovely light that was glowing from these um, orbs of color um, were making me feel very calm and very safe. So I thought, I realized I was, I was, I was, I was, on a completely different, I, I was no longer on the hospital bed that I'd been on this hospital trolley or whatever. You know, I was I was on I was now laid out on a huge slate rock. It was like a huge medieval altar is the best way I describe it. Uh, but it felt surprisingly comfortable to lay on, and I I looked to check my wounds because I I the first thing I'd seen when the train had moved on was that my left arm had been cut had been severed from the uh, the elbow down. And uh, but everything was back in place, not even a single sort of um scratch or bruise, which was amazing, and that made me feel again very safe and comforted. So I laid my head back and uh, um, and I realized I was now covered in this beautiful sheet, it was no longer the hospital sort of sheet that they put over you or whatever you know, the blanket it, it was like a it was like a silk satin material and it was like this beautiful light blue and um there was light reflecting off off this beautiful sheet and uh when i looked up i looked above my head and and there were three symmetrical grids of white light that were slowly closing in on me and as they got closer to me um I couldn't take my gaze away from this light, even though it was really intensely bright. Normally, uh, sorry, my headphones will keep coming. <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, normally, I, I I wouldn't have an issue, you know, with with this kind of light. Uh, I would do so. My eyes wouldn't be able to look into that kind of light. But in this is in this absolute plane that I could look into this beautiful light. In fact, I didn't want to take my gaze away because I felt there was a healing energy coming from the light. And um, so I closed my eyes, again, feeling very safe and comforted. Um, and as time went on, I felt suddenly the presence of somebody had arrived um, at the scene, uh, as it were. So I opened my eyes and lifted my head. And there, stood at my feet, was this beautiful being of light an androgynous person wearing a very simple contemporary black t-shirt with this pure white blonde hair and skin that was illuminating light from within. And this person was just smiling at me and I felt safe and comforted by this person. I felt this person was here to, to guard me. And I actually said out loud to this person, I know your face, don't I? Who are you? Where, where do I know you from? I couldn't quite figure it. You know, it's just like, you know, sometimes you can meet somebody at a party and you feel like you've known them throughout the whole of your life, even though it's the first time you've met them. It was like that. And um, this person just kept gazing back at me and just smiled with a knowing smile. So I laid my head back anyhow, feeling protected and, um, and, and enjoyed the energy coming from not only from the light now, but from this person. And then I felt this energy was like sort of like intensified. And I felt like what I, I felt like my body started to sort of vibrate almost like with an energy of, of love. And I opened my eyes and I looked and either side of me were two female forms and they both got their hands slowly hovering over the surface of my body going over every single contour and there was this energy of healing love that was just emanating from their hands it was just like really beautiful and um the girl to my right 
was 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 quite European in, in her appearance. Again, in a very simple contemporary brown dress. Whereas the girl to my left was was more Asian Indian or American Indian in appearance, and and very, wearing a more traditional dress. Um, and again, I felt I'd known these people throughout my whole life, and and I thought, who are they? Who who are these people? And I could only assume at this stage that they they were my guardian angels, as we as we all refer to in our lives, that they'd been with me throughout the whole of my life, guarding and looking over me. I just hadn't been able to connect with them up until this point. Um, so it was at this stage I started to think about my family because, as I say, they'd been pretty distraught and my mother was just crying and I just thought they're going to be really upset now because clearly... I've I've not made it. I've passed on. So I tried to ease myself over the edge of this huge sort of great rock that I was laid on. And I looked down, hoping to see them. And um, when I did look down, um, I, I couldn't see them at all in the hospital. But what I did see was this most beautiful, awesome sight. It was a huge waterfall of stars. And um, instead of millions of tons of water cascading over the edge of this waterfall of stars, there were billions of sparkling stars that were just slowly cascading over and there were shooting stars flying over and down through the middle. And I just thought, wow. And I realized I was not in a small darkened room as I had initially thought, that I was actually in the universe itself and I was part of this universe. And it was just a tremendous feeling a liberating feeling to, to to know that i was there and i had no fear whatsoever of this at all and i had no fear of this great abyss that i was staring down into only awe and the more that i i fixed my gaze the further i, I could look down and the more colors and nebulas i could see forming and um i just thought wow this is remarkable and and i hoisted myself back over and i remember thinking to myself I was upset about my family that I hadn't seen them, but not in a way that I would normally have felt before. I would have felt a lot of angst and guilt and worry and concern. Uh, whereas I remember saying to myself, oh, well, they'll, they'll, they'll get over this and they will get to experience this beautiful realm themselves one day. And they'll experience the fact that life goes on and this is the next stage for them as well. And, um, so I laid out flat again on this huge rock and closed my eyes. And the most profound part of this whole experience was to happen right at the end. Um, as I lay there with my eyes closed, I felt this energy of love, this beautiful unconditional love that was happening all around me, suddenly intensified tenfold. Um, so I lifted my head once more and just beyond the person stood at my feet, um with the white blonde hair was this huge tunnel of white light it was slowly coming through the universe through the stars and coming towards me and this huge tunnel of white light was surrounded by these very dramatic flames uh that was slowly circulating around this very intense bright white light which again i couldn't take my gaze away from and uh i knew at this point that what i was staring at was was god this was the source of all creation, not in the usual form of God that I'd been that I'd seen in my textbooks at school or what have you, or or you know that the image of God uh, with the long beard in in by the Renaissance painters and it, this was no, this was God in the form of this huge tunnel of white light, and the energy just causing every single molecule of my body to vibrate with love from this source of all creation. I remember laughing to myself with absolute joy and pleasure. And it was at that point that I came crashing back into my body. I was back in the hospital and suddenly the beautiful white light was now, it was the, the fluorescent strip in the hospital that was just screaming into my eyes. And uh, the noise was just kind of like on overbearing and um, the pain came rushing through the whole of my body. Wow. That's amazing. I want to take a second um, to discuss the way you saw God. Because 
I think it's very different than um, what we normally think of God looking like. So I wanted to ask you, before this whole experience, were you a religious person? Did you believe in God? What was your relationship with religion? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question because um, really I was... Both my parents uh, were Christian, and so when when I was young, when I was a kid, we, we went to church, and I didn't really feel comfortable going to church. I didn't really get it, you know, as a young infant. I just felt it didn't work for me. I was never an, uh, what, uh, what we would call an atheist, um, but um, I just didn't believe in the church at that point. Uh, my parents were very liberal, and, and they said, that's okay, you don't need to go, you can stay at home on Sundays, which I did. So from that point on, I never really entertained the thought of of religion or thinking about God or anything. You know, my whole lifestyle when I when I was growing up and when I'd moved to London was, was quite hedonistic, I guess, you know. So it was all about living for, for, for the... I don't know, living day to day and not really thinking about about faith or, or religion. I wish I had. It would have helped me an awful lot through those difficult times. So, yeah, so it, so it hadn't really entered my thoughts. And as I say, obviously at school, you know, we had uh, religious education. So that's how I knew about all these, seeing all these paintings of, of, of the images of God, you know, on the ceiling of the Vatican and what have you. But no, I didn't. it didn't really come into my lifestyle. And one curiosity that I had, um, I know that you've mentioned previously um, when you got well afterwards, you were interested in what kind of meds you were on while they were taking care of you in the hospital, just to sort of understand if anything could have interfered with your consciousness and could have potentially caused what you experienced. My interest is more, why did you have that question? Was it something inside of you that wanted to know? Or was it more brought on by the people around you? Um, yeah, it wasn't me. I, I had no doubt at all about what had happened. You know, it was such a powerful thing to happen that, that I didn't question it and never have done. Um, I did it really because I... I I knew that I was. I wanted to write my story, and I wanted to write a book. And I thought, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this right. When I say right, I knew that um, I'd be questioned. I'd be doing interviews, and and that's and, and quite fair enough that, that some people would question what had happened to me. Some people might say, well, maybe this was there were mind bending. Um, the drugs that you were given and stuff like that so that's why I decided I got a friend who was who lectured in nursing and I spoke to her and I said look if I I can buy my records from the hospital if I give them to you to look through would you be able to you know give me your answers on um what they were and what kind of effect they would have had on me and stuff so that's why I did it yeah because because people do question. Um, it's 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 you know it's part of the way we all are. There's nothing wrong with it. I I I don't mind it. I'm quite happy to speak with people who who are coming from a scientific point of view. Um, because I believe in science as well. You know, because without science, I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now. I mean, science saved me as well. Even though I talked about something more powerful than all of us saved me on that particular day in the accident itself. That I I do know that that science you know you know that the doctors and and the consultants who were amazing in the hospital i've got nothing but respect for them so yeah so i wanted to do it from that perspective makes sense and also i wanted to touch upon the people around you um how did you deal with i think the questions um because i think coming out and telling your story about what happened is a very brave thing to do i think it's very courageous but it might also open you up and make you vulnerable to the opinions or the judgment of others potentially not believing or questioning or 
just basically tainting this memory, this experience that you've had with their own thoughts and opinions about it. How did you go around that? Um, well, it's, it's, I guess, when something this powerful happens to you, something so life-changing that it's, it's, it's hard to deny it. I knew straight away. You know, when I was coming around, because after the actual, when I came back into the hospital after the the NDE itself, I was wheeled into theatre and I was under anaesthetic for eight hours after that. And then when I came through, I remember lying in the hotel, uh, sorry, the hotel, the hospital bed in my room, and and um, and I remember thinking to myself, I was contemplating what had just happened. Going under a train was huge. But I couldn't stop thinking about the whole experience itself. And I, all I could think about then was, how am I going to tell the world about this? I've got to tell as many people as possible about this. It's really important that people know about this. And I've never lost that sensation, that, that the importance of that to me personally, anyhow, uh, to share this knowledge. Because it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's such a, a positive, beautiful message that I received, and I want to share that. And of course, you know, there, there are always going to be people out there who are going to challenge that. And and as I say, I don't mind. But, you know, it's interesting because one thing I've, I've started doing since I have come back from this is I, I watch lots of TV programs and documentaries about the universe and how the universe works and 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 the scientific knowledge that's, that, that's being gained on 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 the origins of the universe. And the more and more I watch these programs, it's interesting because a lot of the scientists that I really respect, they turn around and say, do you know what? We're only at the edge of understanding how the universe works. Even though we're scientists, we don't have all the answers. And that's absolutely true. And I also remember my consultant in hospital saying to me, I was, uh, you know, when I was recovering, I remember asking him questions. And he said to me one day, he said, David, even though we're consultants, we're not experts. We just try our best, and and that's it. So you know, the trouble is that we're, we're all set up to think that there should be a scientific explanation thing, explanation for everything in life, and that's the problem. But and and, and I think once we stop and realise that we don't have a scientific explanation for everything, that then there's nothing wrong with investigating and looking into hearing stories like mine and um because you know it's this the, i'm not out to really make any great gain out of this other than you know try to give some, a positive message basically yeah absolutely um and you've written a book about your experience shine on because you wanted to spread the message and you wanted people to know about your story yeah why do you think that it's important that people who have similar experiences share their stories? Well, because um, what I've realized is, is that um, a lot of people actually fear death. And that's no surprise because it's never really talked about. We don't prepare for death. We prepare for everything else in life. Birth, marriage, even taking our, our driving tests. But we don't prepare for death. And then that's kind of... Now, to me, that seems pretty bizarre because it's going to come to us all and we may as well at least look into it and uh, try and sort of do some research into, into what's uh, into death and, and stuff. So so I kind of figured that it's important from that point of view that, and also from my own perspective, my belief is that that the soul lives on that 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 this is not the end and that that um that that, uh, that this is only one part of our journey and i think that's that's for me if 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 a, a lot of us believe that and feel that that's that's that that can't be a bad thing that can help us with our day to day lives as well because understanding uh, death and understanding what what comes next and feeling that like a, a weight is lifted from that 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 fear that's that's buried deep inside us is um is a positive feeling you know I, I, well that's what i found for myself anyhow has your view on death changed before and after this experience yeah totally it's uh 
as I say, you know, the soul is too great an entity to just suddenly stop. Yes, when we die, the, the body closes down and and and, and fades and, and and but the soul continues on. The soul is such a powerful thing. Um, you know, I've I've lost both my parents over the past few years. And uh, it also helped me with that. You know, obviously, I, I I grieved for them physically, their loss and stuff. But knowing that when they passed, the the their souls were going on to this next stage of life, made me feel a lot better about it. Made me feel a lot more positive that it wasn't simply the end for them. You know, and uh, so it's um it's totally changed my perspective. They, they, you know that it's helped me to to deal with other people's um with, with the loss of other people as well so yeah whereas before um it would have been a struggle it would have been a struggle for me losing my parents and wondering what whether that was it whether that their lives were all in vain if you like that it was all over and that was that was the end but no that's not the case for me now i believe that the soul continues on you know and would you mind speaking a bit more about um, how you've managed to deal through this grief, knowing what you know now? Because I think there's lots of people watching this that will have lost somebody dear and they're just struggling to understand why is this has this happened? Why is this happening now? And how can I just make it through because I'm still here and they've moved on? Um, I think one thing to remember, and that is that um, love continues on. You know, love never dies, basically. That I feel the love of my parents still now. It's not like it's ended. It's not like they've they've both passed and the love is, is no longer there. I still feel just as loved by them now as I did when they were alive and when I was a kid. And I still feel the same love for them as well. And and I think it's worth trying to trying to kind of connect with that if you've just lost somebody. Try to allow yourself to feel that love for that for, for your the person who just passed who you love and try and feel their love back because it, it you will find it you will connect with it you know it's uh, it's 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 something you know it's something i remember when i was younger you'd see those phrases written a lot you know uh, it's on people's gravestones saying love never dies and things like that and i used to think yeah 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 what does that mean love never dies but now i thought no that yeah that's a really powerful message and it's a very powerful message that we should try to take with us when we when we lose someone because it, it doesn't it doesn't just like the soul if the soul doesn't die then then love comes from the soul that's where it comes from you know it doesn't come from the head love comes from the soul you know when you're in love with somebody or they're in love with you it's their soul that loves you and uh, it's not their head maybe yeah sometimes you know when when we think we're we're in love like infatuation you know infatuation that's that's head love you know whereas like real love is coming from the soul from one soul to another so yeah so that's 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 something to to try and and take with you i feel have you ever wondered throughout these years why has this happened to you and by this i mean you traveling through the universe, being able to have an experience that most people don't have. Why do you think it happened to you? Um, it's a tough one to answer that because uh, it's it's it, it, for me. It's just I I can see how it was part of my journey. For me personally, I can see that my life was just going so terribly wrong and that every single door I was trying to press open wasn't opening and that I reached rock bottom. I'd literally run out of money. I was down to about my last pound coin, you know, and, and it was so for me, it felt like I was being given a second chance. And, um, 
I guess that was, it was just part of my that was part of my journey. That was that was part of my destiny from the the moment I came into this earth realm uh, to the point of that accident. That that was destined for me, and um, we all have different destinies. I mean, I remember thinking going back to the my days in London when I said that all my friends that I uh, hung around with who are successful beyond belief some of them you know in the music industry and i thought how come them and not me you know but now i look back and realize well that was their journey that was part of their journey that you know in all fairness they've they've not been challenged quite so much they're having a a good sort of uh, experience in this realm their life is is treating them kind and it's going well for them um so no one single soul is going to have the same journey as the other so i don't think it's good to to compare and say you know oh he's having a better journey than me or i'm having a better journey than somebody else because i had in the death experience because i'm not it's just uh it's just part of my life story and uh this is how it happened for me and and i and i don't have the answer really to everything obviously you don't come back completely like super powered from a from a, a near-death experience and and that's probably the best way i can answer it really and that sort of brings me closer to the next question that i had for you which was if you would be able to go back and take it all away and never have that train accident and never have the experience that followed what would you do um obviously the train accident was horrific it was uh, uh it's it's not something that I would, i'd want to go through again and it, and it's physically um uh, it and mentally it's it's scarred me you know it's it's something that i still have never got over and and probably never will um but i wouldn't i wouldn't trade it for you know for for the you know yeah I, I wouldn't trade it because because my life now is just has got so much more for me personally a lot more purpose and uh, it feels complete a lot and I, I certainly wasn't complete before and I'm not just talking about you know security wise financially or anything like that I'm just talking about me as as a as a whole person I feel so much more complete and life makes a lot more sense to me and so I, I so yeah I wouldn't trade it at all I also wanted to ask about your career because now you're a painter, you compose classical music um, and your career just took a whole different turn. You know, we spoke at the beginning about the kind of work that you were doing that you said yourself you weren't too good at and now you're really at the top of your career. So how do you talk about that change and Especially, I think what I would want to know is, do you think something changed in your talents and skills since that experience? Or do you think that that talent was always within you? You just hadn't uncovered it properly before? Yeah, it's, um, that's a really good question. Um, now, I've, I've realized that, that those talents were within me they were deeply suppressed because when i was at school because i was um academically i was i was struggling that um my my teachers at school uh, suppressed any any thoughts or notions of of wanting to be an artist or a musician you know they said that that you the only work you're going to be able to do in life is working in a factory as i pointed out earlier so i'd given up any any well, I had no dreams or hopes that I'd be doing anything like I'm doing now. Um, the one thing I will say is that when I straight after the only reason I started painting was because I wanted to try and convey what had happened to people in some form, and I thought a painting would be the best way to do it. And I was also scared I was going to forget everything as well. I thought if I do a huge painting like those big Renaissance paintings, like the big biblical scenes, you know, you see in the Vatican, that I thought that that's the best way to convey it to people. And uh, and I got this strange sense of sort of like not egoism, but like a sort of sense of of, of um, belief in myself 
and I thought I can do this. I can do this painting. And so when I started painting, I found that the that uh, I was apprehensive when I first started, but it was coming together really quickly. And I felt that I was channeling, 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 <laughs> channeling ideas through from this other realm, and I was being helped along. So there was a sense of me that was channeling ideas through. So I was being given a crash course in how to technically put a painting together, to apply paint, to bring colors into skin tones and stuff. And then with music, I started writing music. And uh, the bizarre thing about that is that I, I'm not classically trained at all, but I'm now writing music for orchestra. So that is pretty bizarre. But I would also say that um, it's it's all it's 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 not you don't have to have a near-death experience to to discover these hidden talents within yourself you know it's it's um it's really it was um you know it, it was a spiritual awakening and when you have a spiritual awakening you really you view life in a complete it's almost like like the sort of the lens has been cleaned for the first time and you can see clearly all around you 360 degrees and and that's how it was and so i don't know so i feel that there's a sense of me yes totally that these gifts were within me um before and uh but but um they're, 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 that's, i'm still learning i'm still learning my craft i'm still growing and i feel that each thing that i do i'm getting better technically at both my music and my art so it's it's, it's a growing process but it's there for all of us you know it's just you know it, this you read about these things well i do now anyhow because i'm always fascinated by it I, I, especially in the pandemic i found that a lot of people were discovering this you know in the pandemic when when people could no longer go into work and were, and were staying at home you were seeing it all over the internet people were saying they're all doing zoom meetings for the first time and they're all saying hey you know i'm baking bread for my family for the first time hey i'm i'm painting i'm i'm being an artist for the first time hey i'm appreciating nature the the birds and the trees for the first time in my life so it's all there within all of us and and and, and it, it doesn't need to be a near death experience to to bring out those qualities that are suppressed by our day to day lives absolutely and it's quite a difference that I'm noticing from when you were telling me at the beginning about your life before that experience, you know, just not feeling certain of where life would take you, not really knowing what's out there. Um, seemingly working in a factory was the only option that was available, but it wasn't something that you're really into. And now you you're just, you sound very fulfilled by the work that you do. Yes, totally. Uh, it's, you know, as I say, when I worked on the construction site, so I wanted to be good at that work so that I could get, so that I could, so I could sustain a living from it. But I wasn't, you know, I just, I was, I used to look at these guys plastering walls and stuff. And, and, and I think there's, there's an absolute art form to what they're doing. And they just pull it out of the bag really quickly and easy. And I couldn't do it. And I just thought, it's, where do I fit in in this world? What is, you know, where's my place? I don't, I used to say to myself, I used to lie in bed at night and say, how do you do life? How do you do it? How do, how do you make these things work for yourself? You know, I wasn't exactly looking for any great sort of, I, 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 when I said I, I wanted to work in the music industry, it wasn't really coming from an egotistical point of view, like I wanted to be a great rock and roll star. It was more that I wanted to be, um, just just have some kind of you know purpose in life i wanted to have some kind of role that says yeah this is what you do this is it um but yeah so now i found that sense of of um, of wonder and that sense of purpose and uh, it's 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 a very liberating feeling yeah so your life has changed quite a lot since that experience and for the good yeah it has most certainly and um and also, you know, this for me, it's not just about the creative elements in my life. It's just, um, it's being able to um, talk to people like yourself and, and, and discuss my story and how it's affected me and, and how hopefully it can help uh, others. Um, that's equally as important, you know. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great feeling, you know. It's just... You know, it's just if you can give in this life, if you can, if you can have any 
kind of career or in, in, in this in this world where you're giving then it's 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 a it's a wonderful feeling we all know that don't we we all know that's that great feeling even if it's a small thing even if you just walk past um you know if you, you you've helped somebody in this life just a, a very small favor when you walk away you feel great don't you, you feel, it's a lovely feeling you feel oh my goodness i've just helped that person that was great that's a, that was lovely that i was able to do that and so yeah so that's 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 given me an awful lot of sense of purpose in in my life and um, being able to share my my experience and 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 share it and um and thankfully again that's why science is great because without science we wouldn't have the internet i wouldn't be able to talk to you now it's great to be able to reach out and just share stories uh worldwide it doesn't it, i don't just have to jump on a plane and go out and uh, and uh and, and speak to a, a group of people you know I'm, I'm reaching as many people as possible and and so that's that's a lovely feeling yeah you are and your story, I think, is really meant to reach millions and millions of people and give them hope. And that's where I wanted to take our conversation to. Because um, I want to acknowledge there's so many people struggling with depression, anxiety. It's almost like the depression pandemic out there. Uh, grief as well, we talked about earlier, anger. Um, and there's also lots of people that sort of don't know how they're going to make it through the day and they just live on not really certain of why it's all happening for them. Do you have any piece of advice for those people, anything that you would share with them based on what you've learned so far in your life? I would do, yeah, and that is to try and find some kind of some kind of faith in your in you in your life um because that's what was missing for me before you know because i didn't have that faith and i realized that as i talked of earlier that my guides had been with me throughout the whole of my life and i just hadn't been able to connect with them whereas i now connect with them you know almost daily you know if i'm going through any struggles i'll reach out and speak to my guides and and connect with them and ask for their help you know, I'll ask God for help, and um, and I'm not afraid to ask for it either. You know, because unfortunately, I think that's what why I struggled with church when I was a kid, and that's because a lot of faiths have a lot of rules attached, and 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 a lot of those rules uh, make you feel slightly afraid to ask for help. You know, almost like you're not worthy in a sense. You know that, um, you know, I I I I'm, I'm not at all bringing down any 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 faith whatsoever when i say this because i i do actually believe that people who who go to church and have a faith um it's they're in a much better place and, and it's and it's great if you can find a church churches are amazing places you know i remember going walking into a church with a friend of mine who who's uh, agnostic and uh, he said to me he said you know it's amazing just walking into these places where even though you he'd got no faith that um he sensed that the energy the history of that place and the the energy was just so calming and, and beautiful and peaceful and it was like a meditative state being there so you know it's it's um it's great just to sort of try to find some kind of faith basically and have also know that we are all loved because that's one thing i learned in this other realm was that, that when I talked about the unconditional love that was being given to me, I realized that I'd spent the whole of my life feeling un, unloved, even though my parents loved me. But I mean, I felt a sense, I didn't love myself, basically. And, and I realized once I was in this realm that I suddenly felt self-love. And I felt that when I came back, that once I was armed with the self-love, then I suddenly felt self-worth and um and the, the two are combined and, and the, the two very powerful forces that self-love and self-worth and and it will help you to sort of make sense and to also realize that um that that life is here's the challenges you know it's it, all of us it, it doesn't matter where we're coming from that those challenges don't go away and 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 i'm not just talking about 
human life. I'm talking about the animal kingdom, birds, fishes. Mother Earth itself is being challenged constantly, and uh, that's the law of the universe. And if we accept that 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 is is, is the law of the universe, that, that those challenges is, are there then I, th I also think it's important not to try as we do and say, I've got to, I've got to overcome this quickly. I've got to get rid of this. You know, I've got to go out and buy myself some new clothes that will help me and all those different things. No, actually accept if things go wrong, hold them and, and hold them there and, and keep them with you and nurture that awful feeling that you're going through and, and allow yourself some self love. And, um, and and try not to overcome adversities instantly and look for a quick fix you know allow it to make its way through and it will everything will eventually pass you know and, and, and it will that, that you know even though you can't see it at that moment in time things will will get better and 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 resolve themselves it's it's that is also the law of the universe as well the universe wants us to keep recreating and moving forward and that's that's what my take is yeah beautiful and i absolutely agree i think it's so beautiful to hear you say that and on the other hand i think most of us in our daily lives we're just you know we think we should be positive we should be learning through every challenge that we have and we end up just basically sweating the small stuff. Um, you know, this, uh, you receive an email that's not maybe too friendly um, or the vacation you wanted to go on doesn't really uh, go through. And it almost seems in those times that it's the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And that's very much a first world problem, I have to say. Um, but how do you deal with you know these minor inconveniences things that people tend to blow out of proportion do you have a way of dealing with that yeah i do um one is meditation meditation is great and um it's i find that really useful um and it helps me just to switch off from the busyness of the world and especially with right now, because there's no denying it that, you know, there's, we're, we're going through very challenging times in our world. And, um, I, the other thing is because we're going through such challenging times in the world, I think it's important to be mindful of how you take the news in that's given, that's fed to us because we've got the internet now. That's the, the negative side of it is, is that we're fed so much news and it's everywhere and it's just it is the, the the same story that goes out in the morning is, re is is rotated throughout the whole day and there's a there's a very and it's and the news is sold to us with a sense of hysteria and just be aware of that just be aware of how that news has been sold to you it's nothing new that's the way it was and back in the days when I mean, it was just newspapers you know when the titanic sank you know you see these old you know the newspapers headlines was there titanic sinks thousands die and and what have you and and, and they that's how they got people to go out and buy their newspapers so it's, it hasn't changed so there's a sense of um sensationalism about the news so what i tend to do is i listen to the news each day because i want to know what's going on in the world but i switch it off after you know i've i've heard the story of here we go right they're, they're now chewing on, on the bone here let's let's stop and switch it off and it's not being in denial. It's just being allowing yourself to ground your, reground yourself, if you like. You know, because if you're not grounded yourself, then you can't, you can't possibly deal with all the trauma that's happening worldwide. The other thing is, is sleep. Sleep is really important. You know, it's like um, sleep literally, you know, recharges our batteries you know it, it cleanses our mind and and cleanses our thought it's like it's like emptying the trash being on our laptops you know and 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 that's what it's doing uh it's time we sleep at night so trying i try and get plenty of sleep and eat well and stuff like all those different things you know because that's what animals do that's what they do the whole animal kingdom you know they all they sleep you look at dogs all the time especially in the winter all they want to do is sleep 
And what's wrong with that? You know, that's uh, that's because they're they're just following the laws of the universe, and we we've forgotten to do that because we just feel like we've got to be busy all the time. We feel like we've got to be positive all the time, and I I I, I don't actually say that. I don't say to people, look, you need to be positive. I don't think you do. You know, I think that's uh, that's the whole thing to try and avoid telling yourself. Uh, in, from my own perspective, it is is. Um, you know, try to because it, it's putting added pressure on, on onto your life if you feel only because that's the media. That's the way the media is. The, the media is very much a very it's it's an, an unconscious being. You know, in in a sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you think life is happening to us or for us? Again, it's going back to what I'm saying. It's it's happening. It's happening for us. Um, even even the tough times because without without adversity without challenge in your world in your life uh, then there's no growth you know there's no spiritual growth and you we all find that you know we're, we're, all the tough times we've been through we come out and we are a lot stronger from it that we become you know stronger people and and, and uh it's we're able to deal with issues from that adversity so that means that even the tough times yeah that they're, they're they're happening that they're, they're part of our of our of our highway that is is the way i try and look at it i look at our, our, our um, road trip through life is just one one highway and um, there's going to be you know all sorts of uh, dust balls thrown across that highway as we go along and um each one that we avoid we feel a lot better afterwards Lovely. It's been such a good conversation and I could honestly just sit here talking to you and listen to you for hours. Oh, thank um, you. But my last question is, how can people connect to your work? How can they find out more about you? How can they connect with you? Yeah, um, well, um, you could go to my website, uh, which is uh, it's called shineonthestory.com. Um, where you'll find all the links to my social media. If you could, if you want to follow me there, you can see what all the different things are coming up, and you can see my paintings and 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 what have you. Or you can just Google in my name, and, and you will find me there. If you Google in David Ditchfield, you you, you know I, I usually come up, and you'll you'll see my social media links there. So uh, yeah, that's probably the best way to go about it. And also, if you want to listen to my music, actually, the first symphony that I, I, I composed, which is called The Divine Light, which is based on my near-death experience, uh, you can stream that for free uh, on my SoundCloud page, or or if you go to the to, to the actual website, you can stream it there and have a listen and see some of the paintings as well. Brilliant. We'll add all the links uh, in the descriptions below or in the show notes, so they're Thank available you. for everyone.